Imhotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. We're also broadcasting on that, 10 a.m. Superstations, uh, WFDF uh, Facebook page as well. All right, so uh, yesterday we talked about the uh, State of Black America report from the National Urban League, and we were just getting into it. And I shared an interview that um, uh, Mark Morial, president of the National Urban League, shared a couple of interviews that he did on Tuesday. And they revealed the report at uh, Clark Atlanta University in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this morning on Morning Joe, right at, towards the end, last four or five minutes of Morning Joe, MSNBC, they have Mark Morial on, and they talked about the uh, median household income uh, for African-American households compared to white American households, okay? The median household income. Uh, it is $43,862 uh, for African-American households compared to $69,823 for uh white americans that's a 37 percent difference a 37 percent difference and they laid this out also um in the report uh on reverend al sharpton show today uh politics nation right here on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf this is one of the things he talked about today and uh, so yesterday i said we'll talk yesterday when we dealt with the uh, state of black america report I said we would talk some more about it uh, today, okay? So we're going to do that, and uh, we may uh, talk about it uh, some more on Thursday's show. All right, and then also, so we'll discuss that, and then also Frank James, um, who is the uh, uh, Brooklyn subway uh, uh, shooting suspect, he was arrested today. So millions of people around the country watch that uh, play out today also. So we'll give you an update on what's taking place there. All right. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you can chose the covers of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. All right. Um, and I'm going to send this to you here in just a second here, Shakita, because we're going to go to uh, clip number one. So if we look here... Uh, so there were, there were a few good articles I, I was looking at. Now, uh, half these articles uh, dealing with the National Urban League, I'm seeing half of them are written by the Associated Press. So the one from the griot.com, and I looked at some from some other uh, news outlets. They, they, they picked up the article from uh, the Associated Press. OK, so it's not um, an original article. It's just the same. It's basically the same information, okay? Uh, the one from NBC News picked up the uh, uh, article from the uh, Associated Press, all right? But if we look at this here, uh, and let me see here. Uh, I'm going to say this to you right now, Shakita. Uh, this is clip number one. Cue this up for me, please. We're going to go to that here in just a minute. So... National Urban League says the state of black America is grim figures on black health disparities, wealth inequality and more uh, quote change so little and so slowly in quote said National Urban League president Mark Morial. This is a good article from uh, NBC News. If we take a look here at the I have the actual I have the executive summary of the actual report up so you can go to state of black stateofblackamerica.com uh, to look at the, uh, read the actual report, it's free. Uh, this is the executive summary right here. And the name of the report is uh, Under Siege, 
the plot to destroy democracy, under siege, the plot to destroy democracy. Okay, now also on today's show, um, April 13th is the anniversary of the Colfax massacre, which took place during reconstruction in Colfax, Louisiana. And this centered around elections, this centered around politics. Okay, the Colfax massacre. And you had, um, the estimates are about 150 African-Americans were killed uh, in this massacre. So it, it took place uh, April 13th, uh, 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana. This was during Reconstruction. So today's the anniversary of the Colfax massacre. I, I posted on our Facebook fan page this morning, I posted a uh, article dealing with this from uh, the Zen Education Project. So we'll talk about that some on today's show as well. Okay, so if we look at, um, so they have the table of contents here. This is just the executive summary. And they do with the equality index um, and with their equality index, they lay uh, and they talk about this here in the article from uh, NBC News and Associated Press. Uh, the National Urban League uh, released its annual report. Let me flip back over to this here. The National Urban League released this annual report on the state of Black America on Tuesday, and its findings are grim. This year's Equality Index shows Black people still only get still uh, get only 73.9% of, of the American pie white people enjoy, 73.9% of the American pie white people enjoy. All right, so when we go through and look at this here, uh, we're going to clip number one in just a second, Shakita. Uh, when we go through and look at this here, we see them lay out uh, on page five, all right, the uh, equality index and they look at um economics health education social justice social justice and civic engagement all right um and then we look at uh okay let me scroll down okay so do they have some of the contributors uh statements from some of the contributors who contributed to um to uh, this year's report also um what caught a lot of people's eyes this morning was uh this graphic here that was on morning joe and i'm waiting for morning joe to actually uh load the uh, upload the video from the interview they did with uh, mark morial this morning He's going to be back on MSNBC uh, on Morning Joe on Thursday. So on Thursday show, uh, hopefully ho on Thursday, hopefully they'll upload the video and we'll talk about it on Thursday show. This is what had a lot of people talking. This graphic here. All right. Um, African-American uh, median household income, forty three thousand eight hundred sixty two dollars. Uh, white median household income, $69,823, 37% uh, difference. And this also contributes to the racial wealth gap as well. I want to go to clip number one here. This is uh, so uh, on Tuesday, April 12th, uh, Mark Murial was on the PBS News Hour on PBS to talk about the State of Black America Report 2022. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. is the state of black America in 2022. A new report from the National Urban League paints a picture on everything from the economy to voting rights. John Yang has more on its findings. Judy, since 2005, the National Urban League has released an annual equality index to compare how black Americans are doing in comparison to white Americans. This year, the index shows that black Americans get only 73.9% of what white Americans enjoy not much different from what it found in 2005. While there have been significant gains in some areas like economics and health circumstances, both up about 10 percentage points since the first report, in other areas like social justice and civic engagement, Black Americans have lost ground, according to the report. 
Mark Morial is the president and CEO of the National Urban League, and he joins us from Atlanta, where he released the report earlier today. Mr. Morial, thanks for joining us. What does it say that in it's been almost two decades since 2005, and yet the overall index number is, is virtually the same? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. What it says is that the disparities in American life between blacks and whites are persistent, locked in, locked in in a sense of suspended animation, where you could have, as you indicated, some progress in some areas and then a decline in other areas. But proverbially, it's the caboose on the train syndrome, where black Americans remain behind white Americans. Even when things improve for black Americans, they're improving at the same rate or even more for white Americans at the same time. So this is the persistent challenge for 21st century America. Can these gaps, these structural uh, gaps of racial inequality be closed in the 21st century? All right, we're coming up on a break. Just back that up about 20, 30 seconds, Shakita. We're coming up on a break. We're going to continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Back from break in four minutes. Stand by. All right. Okay, back from breaking three minutes. Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. Back from breaking two minutes. All right, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AH and show through Cash App. And also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So this helps us keep doing the research and stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Back from breaking one minute. In the African History Network show, we deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. 
Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. Okay, the call in number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, uh, right before the break, I was sharing this uh, interview that Mark Morial did uh, on Tuesday on uh tuesday april 12th on pbs news hour dealing with the uh state of black america report 2022 let's go back to this clip please q americans remain behind white americans even when things improve for black americans they're improving at the same rate or even more for white americans at the same time so this is the persistent challenge for 21st century America. Can these gaps, these structural uh, gaps of racial inequality be closed in the 21st century? You talk about that, what you call the caboose syndrome, and we talk about the gains in, say, economics, but the gain means you're only up to about, uh, the black Americans are only up to about three-fifths of what white Americans uh, enjoy, and in health, health, it's about 84%. Talk a, bit, a little bit about those areas where there have been gains. Well, I think uh, the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of Medicaid had a dramatic impact uh, by increasing the number of black people who were insured. It closed uh, the health gap somewhat, but still a 16-point differential is too much. The discussion about race and racial justice in this country is not fact-based all too often. It's sometimes driven by what people think or perceive or uh, what they make in terms of political pronouncements. This gap remains why this gap remains a challenge for 21st century America. And the areas where the, the, this report shows a decline since 2005, education, social justice, a significant drop in social justice and civic engagement. Talk a little bit about that. The war on drugs, the broken nature of the criminal justice system, uh, the way in which police and communities are at odds, the way in which black people are shot in an unjustifiable fashion by the police, all of these contribute. The sentencing disparities, uh, and while there's been efforts to address this, they've not gone far enough. That contributes to the social justice gap that exists in the nation, in civic engagement and voting, a big focus of this report, uh, we saw significant gains where black voter turnout in the 2008 election exceeded white voter turnout. That reversed significantly in 2016 when you had Russian interference and post Shelby v. Holder voter suppression laws. Uh, now in 2020, that gap in terms of voter turnout narrowed a bit, primarily because the pandemic forced states uh, to uh, be more visionary and I think uh, more open in allowing people to vote by mail, uh, to drop their ballot in a drop box, to utilize absentee voting. Voter suppression post January 6th, the day of the insurrection, uh, where 40 states plus have introduced hundreds of bills uh, to take away uh, all of these expanded options for people to vote uh, will narrow the civic engagement uh, or really widen the civic engagement gap if we do not do something. And that's why the report has a focus on this plot to what we think diminish and destroy American democracy. And it's also why, as I understand it, you chose to release this in Atlanta today, in Georgia. Uh, today, you kicked off a campaign at Clark Atlanta University called uh, Reclaim Your Vote. Talk about the, the, the efforts you're making in this midterm election year. I'm so glad you mentioned Clark Atlanta University and uh, the fact that we're here in Atlanta, which on one hand is the cradle of the civil rights movement. Dr. King, John Lewis. Many other greats call Atlanta home, and this was, if you will, one of the epic 1960s civil rights movement. But then on the other hand, Georgia has become ground zero for voter suppression. The way in which the Georgia legislature has reacted 
for the January 5th election and then the aftermath of the January 6th insurrection is to literally lead an assault uh, on the right of people to vote. So we thought we needed to come again to the front lines, the front lines of where people can really get a close-up look at what is happening here in Georgia. We also believe that going to one of our great historically black universities and including the students from Spelman and Morehouse and Morris Brown, along with the Clark Atlanta University community, places a spotlight on why protection of democracy and closing the racial gaps in this country is important to this next generation, to the students who now are in an activist mode, who now are poised to fight. And our civic engagement campaign says to people, frustration is not a strategy. Cynicism is not an option. We have to fight voter suppression, but we have to do everything in our power to participate in the elections this fall, because we've got to put this effort to remind people that if you do not have a seat at the table, you'll literally be on the menu. Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, so that was from, uh, you can pause right there. So that that was from uh, Tuesday, April 12th on PBS NewsHour. Mark Morial talked about the State of Black America uh, report 2022 from the National Urban League. You can uh, read the report, download it, read it, stateofblackamerica.com, stateofblackamerica.com, okay? And it's free to read. Uh, it's free to download it. They have an executive summary that you can read also. So all of our organizations across the country, all of our churches across the country, mass GIDs, various organizations, African-American study groups, history groups, things like this should be downloading this and incorporating information from this into their plans, into their strategies, et cetera. OK, all of our political organizations, grassroots, pol grassroots political organizations, things like this. OK, this is another tool that you can uh, incorporate. Now, if we look here, we're going to clip uh, two in just a second, Shakita from ABC News that I just sent you. If we look here at the executive summary and they, they um, spend a lot of time uh, dealing with voter suppression, which is crucial. OK, because politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, palm resources and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. So all the policies and all this stuff that we want enacted, it turns on the vote. It's impacted by the vote. Um, our right to vote is on the line. The plot to destroy our democracy. Now, the name of the state of black America report 2022 is called Under Siege. The plot to destroy democracy under siege. And we see it right here under siege, the plot to destroy democracy. OK, and they deal with the voter suppression that's taking place. They deal with the attempt to overturn the 2020 election results, especially uh, votes by African-Americans, overturn those uh, votes by African-Americans, especially. Uh, when he talked about the election January 5th, he's talking about the statewide, uh, the two statewide Senate races in Georgia, January 5th, uh, 2020, won by Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. So uh, on page 13, so let me back up, page 12, okay, plot to destroy democracy, gerrymandering, suppression, election sabotage, intimidation. So they talk about gerrymandering, ger gerrymandering states are drawing battle lines. In America, every citizen is entitled to the right to vote and, with, and within that right, our votes are supposed to be equal. However, 20 states have leveraged census data to redraw, 20 states have leveraged census data to redraw congressional maps year because the um, redrawing of the, uh, of the district lines takes place every 10 years based upon census data, based upon census data and growth in different districts, things like this. And the redrawing of the lines takes place at the state level. So whichever party is in control 
uh, in the state legislature, th those are the ones that get to redraw basically the district lines. Now, some states, based upon their state laws, it's a panel. It could be a bipartisan panel, something like that, that gets to do it. However, 20 states have leveraged census data to redraw congressional maps in the last year alone. The new maps proposed by Republican state legislatures are no more are no more than modern day gerrymandering that strips voting power away from communities with African American and Latino voters. Okay, so then they talk about a perceived threat. Okay, so right here, people of color made up 90% of population growth in North Carolina, 95% of population growth in Texas. Yet communities of color in these states have seen decreased representation in Congress. We also saw something similar to this in Texas, okay, where 90% of the population growth in Texas over the past 10 years was non white people, but uh, they picked up, Texas ended up picking up two new white districts. A perceived threat, communities of color powered the country's growth over the last decade, accounting for nearly all population increases for the first time in history. We know the percentage, we talked about the census results here. We know that the percentage of white people in this country dropped to 57%. Uh, in the 2020 census, it dropped under 60% for the first time since 1790 when the first census was taken. African American, Latino, and Asian American households are increasingly moving to suburbs, increasingly moving to suburbs. So today, uh, about 25% of African Americans live in the suburbs. Transforming historically homogenous communities into diverse areas, okay? Uh, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. We're up against a break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. We'll also talk about the Colfax Massacre of April 13th, 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. Stand by. Back from break in four minutes. Back from breaking in uh, two minutes. Back from breaking one minute.
910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African-American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. Okay, um, I want to go back to the uh, executive summary here from the State of Black America 2022 that was released uh, Tuesday, April 12th, 2022. We're going to clip two in just a second here, Shakita. All right. Uh, this one right here. Okay. And we were looking at the section of the executive summary that focuses in on um, uh, the voter suppression. And, and they were talking about a perceived threat, a perceived threat. People of color made up 90% of population growth in North Carolina and 95% of the population growth in Texas, okay? Yet communities of color in these states have seen decreased representation in Congress. All right, uh, as the racial makeup of American suburbs continues to evolve, elected uh, representatives should reflect the needs of all their constituents. Unfortunately, due to racially motivated and partisan gerrymandering uh people of color are not accurately reflected in the redistricting process two states have created a grim framework of gerrymandering uh, of gerrymandering are texas and north carolina texas and north carolina okay so then they go and and talk about the uh redrawing of the maps last decade north carolina's congressional map was uh, South Carolina's congressional map was a 10-3 gerrymander, gerrymander in favor of Republicans. It was struck down as discriminatory and replaced with an 8-5 map. In 2021, the state gained a congressional seat fueled by people of color who made up 90% of the state's population growth. Nonetheless, Republicans drew an 11-3 congressional map likely to eliminate one of the state's only two uh, likely to eliminate one of the state's only two African American members of Congress. Proposed state legislative maps could have eliminated a third African American state senator, a third of African American state senators and one fifth of black state house members, both congressional and legislative maps were struck down by state courts as discriminatory, okay? Uh, but Republicans continue to try to put skewed maps in place. In Texas, 95% of, uh, of the state's population growth was attribut attributable to people of color and those who identify as multiracial. That growth earned the state two additional congressional seats, but communities of color did not see any increased representation. They, they created two new uh, white districts, even though 95 percent of the population growth in Texas was due to the non-white population. They created two new white districts in Texas. On the contrary, their clout was reduced as they were drawn out of previously competitive districts to add safe white seats, to add safe white seats to create safe white districts. OK, so they talk about voter suppression as well. Historic turnout in 2020 in the 2020 election sparked the beginning of one of the most uh, insidious uh, partisan attacks on voting rights in American history. Fueled by the big lie, uh, especially from Benedict Donald, fueled by the big lie and a, a record number of voters uh, from communities of color using mail-in ballots, okay, using mail-in ballots like we talked about on yesterday's show, and early voting partisan politicians in uh, state legislatures around the country have drafted bills and passed laws making it it harder to vote for all of us. More suppressive legislation is in the pipeline in 2022. Okay. 
so by the numbers, between January 1st and December 7th of 2021, 19 states had passed 34 new laws to make it harder to vote. It is the most significant legislative assault on voting rights since Reconstruction. Now, Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877, all right? And in my uh, online class, online history class I teach on Sundays, um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, we deal with the Reconstruction era and the period after Reconstruction, which ushers in uh, Jim Crow laws. Now, it's also important to note, so they got this information here, 19 states have passed 34 laws. They got that from the Brennan, Brennan Center for Justice in, in their report on voter suppression. It's also important to note that 25 states have passed 62 new laws during the same period of time, basically during the same period of time. Uh, and that's in the same Brennan Center for Justice report as well, because Democrats in, in states where they control the state legislature, they've been passing laws to make it easier to vote. All right. Now, 2022 is already shaping up to be another assault on voting rights as state legislatures in 18 states carried over at least 152 restrictive bills from the 2021 legislative sessions. In addition, uh, in addition, in states that allow lawmakers to pre-file bills uh, ahead of the next legis legislative session, at least 96 bills in 12 states would make it harder for voters to cast ballots. And at least 96 bills in 12 states would make it harder for voters to cast ballots. All right. So that's on that's on page 14 of the executive summary. OK, uh, I want to go to clip number. Uh, let's go to clip number uh, two, Shakita. This is uh, so Mark Murray, Mark Murray, uh, president and CEO of the National Urban League was on ABC News today to talk about the state of black America report 2022. Let's go to this clip, please. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's get it queued up here in just a minute here. Let me know. Uh, just press play when it's ready. Relief in New York City. Frank, why'd you shoot all those people? 62 year old Frank R. James is in custody. The clip from charged ABC with a federal News. crime after the bloody attack in a the, Brooklyn the, the, subway the, station during the rush hour. Stop Governor the Kathy Hochul announcing the news. The suspect it. has Shakita. been arrested. <laughs> The arrest comes Shakita. after a 28 hour manhunt. Police releasing several images of the suspect and appealing to the public. Go to the for other help. clip. In a bizarre twist, law enforcement officials say it was James himself who called the Crime Stoppers tip line, saying he heard police were looking for him and he was at a McDonald's in Manhattan's East Village. He said his phone was dying, so they should come quickly. Officers rushed there, but he was already gone. They found James nearby, and he was taken into custody without incident around 1.30. We were able to shrink his world quickly. There was nowhere left for him to run. This video from early Tuesday morning. That's the wrong clip. Go to the clip from ABC News. The, the, the one that says State of Black America. The new report shows social and economic status of black Americans. ABC News 413-22. That's the clip we want to go to. Let's go to that. All right, we'll get that queued up. Um, okay, so uh, you can read the executive summary also, and then... Uh, they have different parts that you can download. So the second tonight, part, a collective sigh of okay. relief. That's the clip from NBC News in New York City. Frank, why'd you shoot all those people? Sixty-two-year-old okay. Frank R. James is in custody, charged with a federal crime Shakita. after the bloody attack in a Brooklyn subway station during rush hour. Governor Kathy Hochul announcing the news: the suspect has been arrested. <laughs> The arrest comes after a 28-hour manhunt, police releasing several images of the suspect and appealing to the public for help. In a bizarre twist, law enforcement officials say it was James himself who called the Crime Stoppers tip line, saying he heard police were looking for him and he was at a McDonald's in Manhattan's East Village. 
He said his phone was dying, so they should come quickly. Officers rushed there, but he was already gone. They found James nearby. And he New reports so social social and economic status of black Americans. That's a that's a YouTube video. That's clip number two, the YouTube video. Let's go to break. This is the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Get back, the people. Get back. Stand by. Stand by, back from breaking four minutes. Stand by, back from breaking four minutes. Back from breaking two minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation and Future Radio. All right, let's go to clip number two. This is Mark Morial. He was on um, uh, ABC News today talking about the uh, State of Black America Report 2022. Let's go to the clip, please. National Urban League has released its 2022 report of the state of black America. The report titled Under Siege, The Plot to Destroy Democracy shows the social and economic status of black Americans, how they feel about social justice issues, and it revealed the various tactics that make it harder for black people to vote. Mark Morial, the CEO and president of the National Urban League is here to break it all down for us. Mark, thank you for joining us. Um, can we start with voting? What did the report find when it comes to voting rights and democracy? Well, thank you for having me, Diane. Uh, it found that there's been a long decades plus effort to really make it more difficult for people to vote with particular focus on black people, uh, Latinos, indigenous Americans, and others. And this began uh, in the aftermath of the Obama election with efforts to challenge the integrity uh, of the Voting Rights Act uh, through the courts. And that effort has been successful. There have been a number of very troubling Supreme Court decisions that have narrowed 
the role and the range and the applicability of the Voting Rights Act to protect against voter suppression, gerrymandering, and vote dilution. Uh, it has also included a political effort uh, at state legislatures across uh, the nation. Pre-2016, uh, there were hundreds of bills introduced to make it more difficult for people to vote, to impose voter ID, to close polling places, to authorize voter purges. In 2016, you saw Vladimir Putin enter the battle uh, with a cyber campaign to undermine and discourage black people from voting by posing uh, his Russian bots as Black Lives Matter activists. And then there was January 6th, the insurrection, the attempted coup, the violence on the peaceful transfer of power. In the aftermath of that, you've had hundreds of bills introduced all across the nation. Some of them are absurd that you cannot give water to someone standing in line. Uh, and But many of them have been substantive. They have as their intent to make it more difficult for people to vote. And Mark, in the report, uh, the year's uh, qual equality index uh, showed that black people only get 73.9% of the so-called American pie that white people enjoy. Uh, what does that pie entail, and, and why do you think that number comes through that way? Uh, Diane, what this index shows is that these differentials are almost in suspended animation. They remain almost fixed with black people functioning almost as a caboose. So sometimes conditions improve, but then conditions for white Americans improve, and the differential remains the same. This is one of the most important dynamics of American life, this, uh, this gap, and it runs the gamut. It's in, it's in health, it's in education, it's in jobs, uh, and it also impacts uh, Latinos. We don't have the Latino numbers, but they index very closely where African Americans are and for a nation to become a multicultural democracy in the 21st century. These gaps must be closed so that every human being can fully participate in the American dream. That's what this is about. So, Mark, when you looked at these results, what in the report stood out to you the most? I think what stood out when we really looked at the results, Diane, is, is the nature of this campaign to undermine democracy, how extensive it is how far-ranging it is, how consistent it's been, and how so much of it has gone on sort of behind the veil. You see the results, but you don't see the money and the people and the organizational effort behind it. Uh, and it is pernicious because right now we uh, as a nation are trying to support uh, and sustain democracy in Ukraine. Well, we have to do it here at home. We have to protect the right to vote here at home as well as in Ukraine. And so this principle, this American value of democracy, is what this report seeks to lift up. Mark, when you look at these numbers, what does progress look like? What is the ultimate goal? And what do you think it takes to achieve it? You know, Diane, the goal is parity. Uh, I think the goal is in America where there are no meaningful differentials based on race, creed, color, religion, or zip code. That should be our goal, economic parity, quality of life parity. Uh, that should be the ultimate goal for all of us. Mark Morial, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Okay, you can pause it right there. Okay, so that was from today, April 13th. That was on ABC News. That's on their YouTube channel. Mark Muriel talking about the uh, State of Black America Report 2022. Now, if we look at this section, now this is the um, equity index here. This is the part. You can download this also. This is the part. The equity index is 30 pages. This is on page 10. 2022 Equality uh, uh, Index of Black America. And then the, we see right here, household income, real dollars, median household income, real dollars. And then they uh, break it down the um, year 2019, $43,862. White uh, family, $69,823. Okay. And one of the things in, the, in one of the interviews I played yesterday, uh, Mark Muriel, he was saying that uh, most of their numbers that they have are pre-COVID-19, before COVID-19 hit in 2020. So we still have to get the numbers from 2020, 2021. Okay. Here you see 
uh, they're looking at 2019 data, all right, to compile. Uh, and then they break down uh, median mail earnings dollars uh, weekly um, as well. Let me break that down. Um, $193 African American men, uh, $1,096 uh, a week white men. Uh, median female earnings uh, dollars weekly, $719. African American women, $877 white women. Uh, so you can go through, break this down. Okay. Uh, you can go through and check this out. They go through and break down all this, this data. All right. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably talk about this some more in the next uh, couple of days as well, especially if MSM, MSNBC uploads the uh, interview uh, either from Wednesday or Thursday that they're, uh, because he was on today. But they only had them on for the last four or five minutes. They're on four hours. I don't know why they only had them on for the last four or five minutes. But anyway, that's above my pay grade. Um, we're going to talk about the Colfax Massacre of uh, 1873 in just a second. Let me give you an update on what happened in um, uh, Brooklyn uh, today. We know that uh, Frank James, the uh, suspect in the... Uh, Brooklyn subway shooting. We know um, he was apprehended uh, today. And let me see here. There was a, uh, we don't have time to go to this clip. I have to play it off. Um, um, I have to play it offline. But there's a good article from uh, NBC News. And let's see, let me pull this up right here. Okay, uh, suspect in Brooklyn subway shooting, Frank James is now in custody. And I watched a press conference today uh, that they had uh, uh, Mayor Eric Adams and uh, uh, police commissioner. Uh, so I watched the press conference and let me see if we can go to this article here. Okay, James, 62 years old, was arrested in uh, Manhattan's East Village, uh, ending a 30 hour manhunt, police announced. So police apprehended Frank R. James, uh, who's African-American, who will, uh, he, from statements and YouTube rants, things like this, I think he's mentally ill. It he seems like he has some type of mental illness. Police apprehended Frank R. James, who will face federal charges in the shootings of a Brooklyn subway, which wounded 10 people and injured 13 others, officials said. Uh, James was taken into custody Wednesday um, after police uh, received a Crime Stoppers tip directing them to the East Village neighborhood of New York City, authorities said. Now, uh, police uh, sources said they believe James called the tip line himself, saying he was at a McDonald's on the lower east side of Manhattan. Quote, this is Frank. You guys are looking for me. My phone is about to die. End quote. The sources say the caller said. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're out of time here on 910 AM Superstation WFDF. Uh, we're going to continue this. And then we'll also talk about the Colfax Massacre of 1873. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online classes. Uh, that uh, I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow. Peace. Stand by. Okay. Just a second here. Let me disconnect this call. Okay, um, I want to cue this uh, clip up here from NBC Nightly News. Just a second here. Let me go to this. Uh, Shaquille was having technical difficulties at the studio uh, with one of the videos. All right, just a second here. Let's go to this one right here.
Okay, let's cue that one up. And let me go back to the article here. All right, where the article go? Hold on. Okay, just a second here. Let me go back to this right here. All right, so police apprehended uh, Frank R. James, who will face uh, federal charges in the shootings. Uh, on a, a Brooklyn subway, which wounded 10 people and injured 13. Um, okay, here's a picture of him being apprehended. Okay. He was apprehended with no problems, didn't put up a fight, anything like that. Um, New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who is in isolation following a positive COVID-19 test told reporters in the video feed, my fellow New Yorkers, we got them. The tip that led to Frank James' arrest originally took police to the McDonald's at First Avenue and East 6th Street before officers found him a short time later, two blocks away at St. Mark's Place, ending an intense 30-hour manhunt, official said. As he was led out of the ninth precinct station, uh, station house on his way to jail, a handcuffed Frank James declined to answer any questions shouted at him by reporters and photographers. All right, let's go to. Um, I want to go to this clip here. Where is it? Okay, hold on just a second. Let me um all right, let's go to this clip here. So this is from uh NBC Nightly News today. Here's an update. Okay, it's gotta get past this ad. Stand by. Sixty-two-year-old Frank R. James is in custody, charged with a federal crime after a collective sigh of relief in New York City. Frank, why'd you shoot all those people? Sixty-two-year-old Frank R. James is in custody, charged with a federal crime after the bloody attack in a Brooklyn subway station during rush hour. Governor Kathy Hochul announcing the news. The suspect has been arrested. The arrest comes after a 28-hour manhunt, police releasing several images of the suspect and appealing to the public for help. In a bizarre twist, law enforcement officials say it was James himself who called the Crime Stoppers tip line, saying he heard police were looking for him and he was at a McDonald's in Manhattan's East Village. He said his phone was dying, so they should come quickly. Officers rushed there, but he was already gone. They found James nearby, and he was taken into custody without incident around 1.30. We were able to shrink his world quickly. There was nowhere left for him to run. This video from early Tuesday morning shows James entering the subway in Brooklyn, struggling to get through the turnstile before going through an emergency exit. <laughs> Two hours later, investigators say he opened fire on the crowded train. Ten people were shot. 29 total injured, including kids heading to school. One victim just 12 years old. Police say James then used the subway to flee, getting on a train across the platform, riding one stop, shoulder to shoulder with some of his victims. He later entered a station in another Brooklyn neighborhood. Law enforcement now piecing together his past. He is known to us and has ties in Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York City. James was born in New York and has nine arrests here dating back to 1992. Charges including criminal sex acts and possession of burglary tools. Police say he purchased the Glock 9mm handgun used in the attack at an Ohio pawn shop in 2011. 
There are dozens of posts from James on social media, many filled with profanity-laced rants about race, violence, and even mocking New York Mayor Eric Adams for trying to make the subway safer. And I'm on my way to Philadelphia. In this video, James talks about traveling from Milwaukee to Philadelphia, where police say he rented the U-Haul van found a few miles from the scene of the attack. Investigators still haven't determined a motive or why the suspect attacked the 36th Street stop. Tonight, that station is once again filled with commuters. The city runs on the subway. And you feel perfectly safe? Yeah. Ron joining us now from the police precinct where James was being held after being taken into custody. Ron, what's next for him? Lester, he's now in federal custody because of the charge he's facing. We expect him to make his first appearance in court sometime tomorrow. And if convicted, he could face prison for the rest of his life. Lester? All right, Ron Allen, thank you. And investigators have been looking into what Frank James was doing before yesterday's attack. I want to bring in justice correspondent Pete Williams now. Pete, what are we learning? Well, police and federal agents, Lester, say he's had no steady job or fixed address the past few years. They say he rented that U-Haul van Monday afternoon in Philadelphia using his own name. He apparently slept in it a bit, then drove it into Brooklyn Tuesday morning, caught on surveillance video crossing a bridge just after 4 a.m., and then about two hours later, investigators say a camera recorded him getting out of the van and walking toward the subway. Police say cameras in the subway show him entering the system a short time later wearing that distinctive vest, Lester. And Pete, police say today uh, he has an extensive criminal record. So how was he able to buy a gun? Because none of those charges resulted in felony convictions. So he was still legally able to buy a gun. And that purchase 11 years ago was a legal one. Investigators say this is a close-up of that weapon, showing that he tried to obliterate the serial number, but ATF used that number to trace the purchase of the gun to Frank James, and that is a key piece of evidence in the federal charges filed today, Lester. Okay, Pete Williams, thank you. All right, so that's what happened today. Uh, you can also look at the uh, live updates from... Uh, New York, the New York Times as well. Hold on just a second. Let me stop this. You can look at the uh, live updates from the New York Times also. Okay. Um, and they talk about a Syrian immigrant, um, a shop owner and an artist are among those who say they played a role in leading the police to Frank R. James. And he may have called a tip line on himself. Uh, so you can read the rest of this also. Thank you, Zach. Uh, New York has a new hero. There may be more. New York City celebrated a new hero on Wednesday, a 21-year-old Syrian who moved to the United States five years ago, speaks five languages, and lives in Jersey City. Uh, the man named Zach uh, Tahan, a security camera technician whose name has been spelled in varying ways, on social media said he was working on updating equipment at a shop near st mark's place and the first avenue in manhattan's east english village in manhattan's east village when he saw frank r james through one of the security cameras in an impromptu news conference to a crowd of reporters and bystanders on wednesday um uh, zach tahan said quote i thought oh my god this is the guy we need to get him uh he was walking down the street um he was walking down the street i see the car uh of the police i said yo this is the guy okay so we can read the rest of this here they have really good updates here from um the new york times All right, now I want to go to this last story here. So this deals with the uh, Colfax massacre of uh, 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana. And I deal with this in the uh, online course that I teach on Sundays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right, and you can register for the uh, online classes that I teach uh, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information right on the homepage of the website. Um, let 
Let me see here. Just a second. Okay. We have the information around the homepage of, of the website. So I teach this Sundays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, as soon as you register, we have um, basically most of the class already archived. So you can watch at your own pace. Uh, and we do live sessions also, but you can watch at your own pace. And you, once you register for the class, you'll have full access to it even after the course is over. So two, three years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. All right. It's on sale $60, regularly $130. And we do a history from 1803 through 1960 uh, through 1968. We start with the uh, Louisiana Purchase of 1803, and we talk some about the Haitian Revolution. On Saturdays, I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach them in school. This class here, we have 10 sessions already archived. So as soon as you register, we have a ton of information for you to watch. Uh, next class, this one will be Saturday, April 17th, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can register for that one. And we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for uh, $20, for uh, both classes for $100. It's a $260 value. You can register for both classes um, for $100. All right. Now, so the Colfax Massacre um, took place uh, April 13th. 1873. Uh, I, I posted an article uh, today from uh, Zen Education Project. We posted this on our Facebook fan page. And there's also a good article from um, blackpass.org. Okay, so let me pull this up here from blackpass.org. And then there's one from um, Zen Education Project. But then also there's a really um, good article from smithsonianmag.com, Smithsonian Institute. 1873 Colfax Massacre Crippled the Reconstruction Era. So I want to go to the one from uh, the Zen Education Project first because they actually reference um, they actually reference the article from blackpass.org. Okay, let's pull this up here. Okay, so the Colfax massacre occurred in Colfax, Louisiana on Easter Sunday, April 13th, 1873. April 13th, 1873. Uh, Republicans had narrowly won the 1872 uh, election to retain control of the state, but Democrats contested the results. Now, this is a, um, a sketch of the Louisiana, it's called the Louisiana Murders, Gathering the Dead and Wounded. Okay, so this is the aftermath of the Colfax Massacre. This is a sketch of the aftermath of the Colfax Massacre. Now, historian Eric Foner notes uh, of the Colfax Massacre, the bloodiest single instance of racial carnage in the reconstruction era. The Colfax massacre taught many lessons, including the lengths to which some opponents of reconstruction uh, would go to retain their accustomed, accustomed white supremacist authority. Now, fearful that white militias would attempt to take over local parish governments, Republican office holders occupied the Colfax courthouse. And the uh, article from uh, blackpass.org that they reference is, is, is more detailed. Okay, so let's flip over to that one here. Okay, so this is from blackpass.org dealing with the Colfax Massacre of 1873. 
So this was a uh, this battle turned massacre took place in the small town of Colfax, Louisiana. As a clash between African-Americans and whites, three, three white people and an estimated 150 African-Americans died in the conflict. The massacre took place against the backdrop of racial tensions following the hotly contested Louisiana governor's race of 1872. So this is during Reconstruction, which is uh, uh, 1865 to 1877. Now, while Republicans narrowly won the contest and retained control of the state, white Republicans, uh, white Democrats angry over the defeat vowed revenge. In Colfax Parish, um, in Colfax Parish County, as in other areas, uh, as in other areas of the state, they organized a white militia to directly challenge the mostly uh, black state militia under the control of the governor. They organized a white militia to challenge the mostly black state militia under the control of the governor. Now, Colfax Parish reflected the political and racial divide in Louisiana. It's 4,600 voters in the 1872 election were split between approximately 2,400 um, uh, African-American Republicans uh, were split uh, approximately uh, 2,400 uh, mostly African-American Republican voters and 2,200 white Democratic voters. One incident, however, touched off the Colfax massacre. On March 28th, uh, 1873, local white Democratic leaders called for armed supporters, called for armed supporters to help them take the Colfax Parish Courthouse from the African-American and white GOP office holders on April 1st, okay? So they're trying to really overthrow that city that local government they're trying to overthrow it just like the insurrection has tried to do january 6 2021 okay the the um uh, violence that we saw um january 6 18 uh january 6 2021 is a continuation of the violence that we saw during the reconstruction era and post reconstruction like wilmington north carolina 1898 okay uh and then uh during reconstruction um you had another incident the um opelousa massacre of 1868 opelousa louisiana all right surrounding voting and political power as well so we, so the the armed conflict in armed terrorism, domestic terrorism that we saw uh, January 6, 2021, is a continuation of this domestic, this armed domestic terrorist, terrorism by white supremacists to suppress the African-American vote, throw us out of office, overthrow the government, overthrow local governments, things like this. So on March 28th, local Democratic leaders called for armed supporters to help them take the Colfax Parish Courthouse from the African-American and white GOP office holders on April 1st. The Republicans responded by urging their mostly black supporters to defend them. Although nothing happened on April 1st, the next day, the, the next day fighting, the, the next day fighting erupted between the two groups. On April 13th, Easter Sunday, more than 300 armed white men, including members of white supremacist organizations like the Knights of the White Camellia, who we, that we've talked about before, the Knights of the White Camellia and the Ku Klux Klan attacked the courthouse. 
when the militia maneuvered a cannon fire, a cannon to fire on the courthouse, some of the 60 uh, black defenders fled while others surrendered. When the leader of the attackers, James Hatnot, was accidentally shot by one of his own men, the white militia responded by shooting the African-American prisoners. Those who were wounded in the earlier battle, particularly African-American militia members, were singled out for execution. The, indiscrim the indiscriminate killing spread to African-Americans who had not been at the courthouse and continued into the night. And continued into the night. All, all told, approximately 150 African-Americans were killed, including 48 who were murdered after the battle. Only three whites were killed and few were injured in the largely one-sided battle of Colfax. On April 14th, 1873, the state militia under the control of Republican Governor William Kellogg arrived at the scene and recorded the carnage. New Orleans police officer and federal troops also arrived in the few uh, in the next few days to reestablish order. New Orleans uh, police and federal troops also arrived in the next few days to reestablish order. A total of 97 white militia men were arrested and charged with violation of the U.S. Enforcement Act of 1870, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. So really it's, so you do have enforcement acts going back to 1870, but the Ku Klux Klan Act was 1871, not 1870. The Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. There were four enforcement acts, and we, I, we deal with all this in the um, online class that I teach. The uh, so the most popular of the enforcement acts was the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which dealt with um, it was illegal to interfere with elected officials carrying out their. Uh, official duties because the white supremacist wasn't just the Ku Klux Klan. It was the Knights of the White Camellia and the White League and these other, all these different domestic terrorist organizations. And some of them just didn't have names. Okay. Uh, but what happens is, is it was, it became a federal crime to interfere with their, uh, with them uh, carrying out their official duties and the president could declare martial law um, on cities, on counties that uh, where you had these types of uprisings. OK, that was and that that was because of the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, the third of uh, four enforcement acts. If we look at this uh, quickly here, here. Just a second here, let's see. Okay, so this is a slide for my class. This is um, one of the actual slides here. Because we talk about the Enforcement Acts or the Force Acts, also known as Enforcement Acts. What, are, what were the Force Acts during Reconstruction? Force, F-O-R-C-E, Force Acts in U.S. History, series of four acts passed by Republican uh, Reconstruction supporters in the Congress between May 31st, 1870 and May 1st, 1875 to protect the, to protect the constitutional rights guaranteed to African Americans by the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, the major provisions of the acts authorize federal authorities to enforce penalties upon anyone interfering with the registration, voting, office holding, 
or jury service of African Americans provided uh, for federal election supervisors and empowered the president to use military forces to make summary arrest. Okay, empowered the president to use military forces to make summary arrest. So this, even though it was for African Americans, it wasn't specifically to African Americans. What I mean by that is they were attacking white Republicans. The Klan was attacking and killing white Republicans. Okay, so this protected white Republicans also. It protected people from domestic terrorism. Uh, in, in, in those who elected officials trying to carry out their um, official duties, um, people trying to register to vote, especially African-Americans trying to register to vote or actually voting or African-Americans trying to uh, serve on juries. OK, and it, it protected them from intimidation and attacks trying to serve on juries as well. This is federal law. So under the act of April 20th, 1871, so the one April 20th, 1871 is the third of the four acts. That one is known as the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is still on the books today. And Representative Benny Thompson is suing Donald Trump and uh, some of his uh, uh, henchmen uh under the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, and this is also uh, the uh, some of the, some of the police officers, uh, Capitol Hill officers, have filed lawsuits. Uh, they're filing lawsuits using the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Now, under the Act of April 20th, 1871, nine South Carolina counties were placed under martial law in October 1871 nine south carolina county south carolina is also where the civil war started december 20th uh i'm sorry south carolina is it was the first state to secede from the union december 20th 1860 and it's where the civil war started april 12 1861. now this act and earlier statutes resulted in more than 5,000 indictments and 1,250 convictions throughout the south in subsequent Supreme Court decisions, various sections of the acts were declared unconstitutional, but the but the bill, the, the, the law is still on the books and is still being used today. What was the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871? The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 defined citizenship and guaranteed due process and equal protection of the law to all. Vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan, however, freely threatened African-Americans and their white allies in the South and undermined the Republican Party's plan for reconstruction. The bill authorized the president of the United States to intervene in the former rebel states that attempted to deny, quote, any person or any class of persons the equal protection equal protection of the laws or of equal privileges or immunities under the laws, end quote. Now, uh, to take action against this newly defined federal crime, the president could suspend habeas corpus. That means uh, them going to court, suspend habeas corpus, uh, deploy the U.S. military or use, quote, other means as he may deem necessary, end quote. Now, this comes from history.house.gov. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan at the 1871. That's the uh, house.gov is the official website of the U.S. House of Representatives, and they have a history section there also, okay? They have a history section. So these are some of the actual slides uh, from the class uh, that I teach. All right, now, and let me see, we have the, uh, where's the info? Okay, and we have the info here on the bundle pack right here, I'll post this. And the information is at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com.
All right, let's go back to I'm gonna go back to this article here from uh, blackpants.org. Okay, so a total of 97 white militia men were arrested and charged with violation of the U.S. Enforcement Act of 1870, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. A handful of them were convicted, but were eventually released in 1875 when the U.S. Supreme Court in, in the uh, case United States versus Cruikshank ruled the Enforcement Act was unconstitutional. No one was ever arrested by the state of Louisiana or by or or by in or or by intimidated local officials. OK. All right. So. Check this out here, dealing with the um, Colfax Massacre of 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana. That's from blackpast.org. Um, all right. You can register for the online classes I teach on the weekend. That So we have a lot of the content already um, archived because I've been um, – uh, archiving it over the past uh, few weeks, okay? So as soon as you register, we have a ton of content for you to start watching. On Saturdays, I teach uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So the next class is going to be... Um, Saturday, April 17th. Okay, this next class. And so as soon as you register, we have a ton of content for you to start watching. Classes on sale $60, regularly $130. Um, and then on Sundays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay, so uh, next class of this one since... April 17th is Easter. The next class will be April 24th. But as soon as you register, we have about 10 sessions archived for you to watch. Then you can join us in class April 24th. All right. And that class is $60. Also, we have a bundle pack. You get both classes for $100. Once the course is over with, you still can go back and watch the entire course. You have full access. So two, three years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. Um, if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Or if you have any questions, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. But if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, uh, you'll get a 50% discount. Okay. All right. Uh, also, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, and then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, uh, pay some of the bills, etc. This is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S H O W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. Here's our link for Cash App. You can click on that. And here's the uh, yellow donate button for PayPal also. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, also, the Power on One conference is taking place uh, in Detroit. Uh, so we'll have more information about that. Uh, on tomorrow's show, uh, we, we've talked about it here, uh, the uh, uh, Power in One conference is taking place um, April 30th and uh, May 1st at the Double Tree Hotel in Detroit. And Dr. Linda Jeffries will be here, uh, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, Professor Jane Small will be here. Um, and many other scholars as well, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, um, Professor Kaba Kamene, he's going to do a presentation. So you can uh, join us live. Uh, you can you can come to Detroit. This is at the Double Tree Hotel, Saturday, April 30th, 2022 through May 1st. 
okay uh how p presents one africa power and unity conference you can also stream it from around the world you can stream it from around the world okay so tickets are available uh i'm gonna post uh the link here we, we have to get this up on the website we'll get this up on the website uh uh, uh it'll be up there shortly and okay here we go I'm going to post this information here. It has the link here to register for the uh, register for the conference. You can also register for live streaming if you can't make it. Okay. All right. So we got that there. Okay. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, this corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll kind of forever, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace.